Okay, so what I want to tell you about today is this idea that we may develop a preference for describing events in one particular causal order or direction in time directly from observational data without necessarily knowing anything about how these events were generated. So if this is the case, then we have to ask where would such a preference come from? Because we just actually heard from Sean that in reality, correlations in events doesn't necessarily imply causation. So this starts off, I'm going to show a short clip and this is actually a movie of a guy who's kicking down the door in reverse time. And when you first encounter this video, it can be a little bit perplexing, which sort of intuitively captures this notion that events can be a lot easier to understand or comprehend when they're presented to us in one particular temporal order, as opposed to in the opposite. So a typical example being watching a movie in reverse time or in rewind can make it much more difficult to understand and comprehend than watching it in forward time. So something like one of Christopher Nolan's films, such as the movie Memento, which is iconic for having it seen scrambled out of chronological order, can be quite an intellectual exercise to understand and follow. Um, and this sort of captures the idea that since the scenes are out of temporal order, you really need to keep track of all of them and sort of piece them together right at the end of the movie to form a coherent narrative. And by this stage, you're tracking a lot of information about the plot line to do this reconstruction. So it somewhat suggests that perhaps it may be easier for us to comprehend and explain a sequence of events in one particular temporal direction. In the sense that we may need to store far less information about the sequence of prior events in order to predict what's going to happen next when we examine these events in one particular temporal order as opposed to in the opposite direction. And this actually turns out to be true. It's a very well-known and quantified um, phenomenon in the context of complexity science, where it's called causal irreversibility or causal asymmetry in the literature. And what it says is that if Bob wants to take the past and use it to make a prediction about what's going to happen in the future, meanwhile his counterpart, Alice, wants to take the future and use it to make a statistically accurate retrodiction about what may have transpired in the past, then in general, Bob's task may be significantly simpler than Alice's, in the sense that he may be able to execute it using much less memory or a much smaller hard drive space. So to get a feeling for this, we're actually going to look at it in the context of a very simple example. Here I have a box which contains a single fair coin. Each time step, I'm going to perturb the box, causing the coin to flip with some probability p. At the end of the time step, the box is going to announce the outcome of the coin flip by meaning a 1 if the coin lands in heads and a 0 if the coin lands in tails. Okay, we reformatted the slide. You can't quite see it, but in doing so, this box will actually produce a string of 1s and zeros, which looks a little bit like this. Um, I can assure you they are actually 1s and zeros. But what I'm actually going to do this process anyway is I'm going to modify it by replacing the first zero in each consecutive block of zeros by a two. And the intuition goes if I try to do this from left to right, then things can be relatively procedurally simple in the sense that I simply need to scan along from left to right, and whenever a one transitions into a zero, I say, okay, this is the first zero in a consecutive string of zeros, I'm going to replace it by a two. However, if I try to do this in the reverse temple order, then things appear to be a little bit more complicated. In the sense that I'm now scanning from right to left in reverse time, I'm saying, is this the last zero in a consecutive block of zeros? So I scan along, and I now need to establish whether this is the last zero in the string. And to do this, I need to look one time step into the future to establish whether the proceeding symbol is going to be a one or a zero and then come back and modify my last output conditionally. So it appears that this actual task of replicating this process may be more difficult than one particular temporal order over the other. And we can sort of formalize this intuition in the context of computational mechanics, which is a sub-branch or sub-discipline of complexity science, which deals with inferring the minimal amount of memory capacity or structure a system must have in order to be capable of replicating certain observed statistical behavior. <laughs> 
The premise behind computation mechanics is really that the system we're interested in describing may be extremely complicated, such that we really have no hope of modeling it from first principles. And instead, what we're going to do is we're just simply going to build a model which is capable of replicating its observed statistical behavior. So the notion here is that computation mechanics gives us a universal prescription for building a causal model of the process, which is capable of perfectly capturing the statistical behavior of the system we're interested in. And this is a little bit of a different notion of causal model from Judea Pearl's um, work. Instead, what we actually mean in this context is that uh, for each possible pass of the process, I want a systematic mechanism for identifying this pass with an internal state of the memory of my model, here given by S, which is somehow a function of what's happened so far in the past, such that afterwards there is a systematic mechanism for me to rip at each a repeated application of it at each time step will allow me to generate a string of outputs which is statistically indistinguishable from those of the process itself. So the key point here is that I want the behavior or the statistical output behavior of my model and my real-life physical system to be indistinguishable, such that there's no real way to operationally tell them apart. And this is in this context of this talk will be what we mean by causal model, as opposed to a directed acyclic graph. So in particular, computation mechanics gives us a systematic prescription for building the memory optimal model of any given stochastic process. This model directly discards any information about the past which is not relevant to future observations by taking any two paths which lead to coinciding future statistical behavior and identifying them with a single internal state of memory of the device. And the amount of information about the past which this model demands as input is sort of a measure of the minimal memory capacity we must sustain in order to be capable of replicating the observed statistical behavior. And because of this, it's actually a very well known and very well adopted quantifier of structure and um, complexity in the complex systems literature, known as the statistical complexity. And its popularity is really due to its operational interpretation as the minimal amount of internal structure the system must have in order to be able to exhibit the observed statistical behavior. So in the context of a coin example, we can actually come back and we can uh, construct the memory optimal models of the stochastic process in both forward and reverse time. So what we find is that in forward time, we always need to retain one bit of information about the past or to make statistically accurate predictions about the coin's future, irrespective of the coin's probability of flipping P. And this is true as long as P is not equal to a half where the whole process com collapses into a completely random string. However, in reverse temple order, in reverse time, in general, we're forced to transcribe far more than one bit of information about the future into our memory in order to be capable of making a statistically accurate retrodiction about what may have transpired in the past. Now, these two mechanisms shown here are actually memory optimal ways of replicating these statistics. In the sense that there's no other classical causal mechanism which is capable of exhibiting the same a uh, task or behavior which stores less information about the past. So what this means is this gap tells us something fundamental about the process in the sense that it inherently takes less information to model this process in one particular causal order from past to future than in reverse time from future to past. I'll put another way, there's a sense of temporal asymmetry in the stochastic process, which I'm sorry you can't see, but that's okay, um, in which if we seek the most mathematically succinct description of these events, then we will privilege a particular causal order in which to represent them as a result. So because of this, this phenomenon of causal asymmetry that we're seeing in this process, of causal irreversibility, has been speculated to be the origin of a barbed arrow of time, which is directly hard-coded into observational data. I should mention that these models are also optimal when we consider the minimum number of dimensions required to replicate the statistics in both forward and reverse time, which means the single two-level classical system is sufficient to execute this um, simulation in forward time. However, if we try to replicate the same statistics in reverse temporal order, then a minimum of a three-level classical system would be required. So there's actually also a different notion of memory capacity in which there's still an arrow of time persisting in this process. So this would seem to be the end of the story. Um, these techniques are provably memory optimal. Um, they're proven by James Crutchfield to be the optimal ways of executing these respective tasks. So they therefore presumably can't be improved upon. 
However, what happened was a few years ago, we realized that we could actually take advantage of quantum mechanics to model stochastic processes while storing less information about the past than the provable classical optimal bounds established by the statistical complexity. So the idea is really, really simple. You can see inklings of it already in the double slit, which is gonna bore half this audience to death. Um, but this is a very basic physics experiment, which is somewhat infamous or famous for the behavior of a single photon, upon, which upon approaching a pair of slits in the divider, simultaneously traces out both possible future paths in the system, going through both slits at the same time in quantum superposition. And if I concatenate multiple of these double slit partitions, then what would happen would be that my photon would evolve into a quantum superposition over all possible trajectories in the system which consists of all possible combinations of different paths through these slits that it could have taken. So what happens is that the natural behavior of the photon is to evolve into quantum superposition of all possible futures in the system. And the question really was, could we sort of leverage this effect to build superpositions over the futures of an arbitrary stochastic process? So that comes down to an engineering task. We had to engineer the dynamics of the quantum system such that it naturally encoded the joint probability distribution for an arbitrary stochastic process inside the wave function of um, the photon. So that's exactly what we have a systematic mechanism for doing. Still isn't displaying properly, but that's okay. Um, what we have is a way of actually building a quantum algorithm which takes a quantum state proxying the past as a seed and uses it to write a tape which is in a superposition of all potential futures of the stochastic process for any given arbitrary stochastic process. Now, if an outside observer was to observe this tape mm -hmm. making a measurement in the computational basis, then he would collapse it into one specific prediction about the process's future with the correct conditional future statistics. What's more, the quantum device generically stores less information than its optimal classical counterparts while doing this. So it stores even less information than the ultimate bounds established by statistical complexity and is therefore more memory optimal than all possible classical analogs. So the question became, what did this have, what implications does this carry for um, causal asymmetry in the barbed arrow time? So if we come back to our simple coin process from the beginning of this talk, then what happens is to replicate these statistics quantum mechanically, all I need to do is associate each of the two internal states of the optimal classical predictive model with um, two quantum states. And then afterwards, there exists a quantum circuit or a prescription for systematically generating a string of outputs which is statistically indistinguishable from those of the optimal classical model. And if I submit the measurements going on in this quantum circuit, then what would happen would be my system would trace out a superposition over all potential futures in this process. Analogously, on the flip side of things, in reverse time, I simply need to take each of the three internal states of my optimal classical retrodictive model and associate them with three analogous quantum states. And then again, there is a quantum circuit, um, which looks messy, but it's actually quite simple. I've given you the two qubit um, gate decomposition for it, which allows me to perfectly replicate a statistically accurate retrodiction about what may have transpired in the process's past. So this was a process which only took a single bit of information to model in forward time from past to future, but generically in reverse time, we need to transcribe far more than one bit of information about the future into memory to model it in, from future to past. However, what we find is that class, uh, quantum mechanically, both the internal states of the optimal classical predictive model, a uh, quantum predictive model, and the internal states of the optimal quantum retrodicted model fit within a single qubit which means that we only need a single two-level quantum system to replicate these statistics in either temporal order. This already stands in distinction to the classical case because classically we need a two-level classical system to replicate this process in four time, but a minimum of three-level classical system to execute the same task in reverse time. And indeed, this is enough to completely lift the causal asymmetry or asymmetry in this process at the quantum level, which is to say that the internal entropy of the optimal quantum retrodictive model is identical to the internal entropy of the optimal quantum predictive model. So this is a process which does not exhibit any causal asymmetry at the quantum level. It's completely causally symmetric. Nevertheless, what we are seeing is that a barbed arrow of time is emerging from directly restricting ourselves to using only classical causal mechanisms to explain statistics. Which is interesting as it means one of the contributing factors to this phenomenon of the barbed arrow of time is uh, 
personal restrictions or biases for using classical causal explanations for the events, irrespective of how they were generated. So what happens in arbitrary stochastic processes? Well, in these cases, you can think of causal asymmetry, which is supposed to be the difference here, as a memory overhead penalty, which is incurred when we insist on modeling the process in a, one particular adversarial temporal direction. It's a cost we pay for our insistence. And it's a really generic phenomena. This isn't isolated. I know I've examined it in the context of a simple example, but this actually is present in almost all stochastic processes. And what we can show is that quantum mechanics can always mitigate this memory overhead penalty in the sense that if we enforce a quantum model to work in the less causally efficient direction, then it will generically store less information than a classical model allowed to be run in the more causally efficient direction which is to say, as a mathematical theorem, that the quantum memory cost of modeling the process is always less than the classical memory cost, classical optimal memory cost when minimized over either temporal direction. And this is completely general, so we can apply it to arbitrary stochastic processes, including ones where the causal asymmetry grows without bound. These are cases where it takes a finite number of bits to model the process in four time, perhaps, but if we were to replicate the same statistics in reverse temporal order, the memory cost would scale unboundedly with a parameter in the process. So here we have an example, which is called a flower process. It only requires log three bits to execute in four time, but in reverse time, the simplest classical causal model is depicted here. And what happens is, as I amp up a parameter in the process, the number of petals in this diagram diverges towards infinity, which means that the memory cost of replicating these statistics in reverse time grows unboundedly. And this leads directly to scaling advantages in the number of um, amount of information we need to say, store to model the process quantum mechanically. So what we see is we get an unbounded advantage in the number of amount of information we have to store to execute a quantum model as opposed to its optimal classical counterpart. We have multiple examples of this now. This is actually not an isolated phenomenon. It occurs in quite a few cases. And I've actually taken a figure from Tom, who's in the audience, because um, it nicely illustrates the way in which the classical memory cost diverges or scales with the parameter we are adjusting in our process, but the quantum memory cost remains finite and bounded. So uh, what this slide was supposed to show was that um, these results all also apply to the minimum dimensions needed to actually replicate the statistics. So I could have given the same talk again, talking about the dimensionality of the physical system required to execute the model which means that we also recover scaling advantages in which we can save an unbounded amount of um, dimensional space in the physical system required to execute the model as a memory substrate, if we choose the model that quantum mechanically. Also, we've collaborated with experimentalists in Australia um, to actually implement uh, photonic realizations of these quantum models, which actually achieved our original vision of having a photon trace out all possible futures of a process in quantum superposition encoded in different optical paths. On the left-hand side, I have an experiment which actually realizes superposition over a single time step into the past of the coin process in this paper. Um, and therefore, it basically was able to confirm the collapse of causal asymmetry in this process at the quantum level. On the right-hand side, we actually have an experiment which realizes superposition over multiple time steps into the future of another very simple stochastic process. In fact, this experiment realized the superposition over three time steps into the future of the stochastic process. And what's more, it was able to construct superpositions over futures of two different stochastic processes in parallel at the same time, which were then able to take and interfere on the beam splitter, allowing us to actually get a statistical signature out of the system, which measured the rate at which the stochastic futures of these two processes diverged. This was encoded into the interference pattern. So, the takeaway message is that this uh, conception that things may be more difficult to understand and comprehend when they're presented to us in one particular temporal order um, is actually formally quantifiable and measurable in the context of complexity science, where it's known in the literature as causally irreversibly or causally asymmetry. And people have speculated that it's an origin of a barbed error of time in observational data sequences. However, what we discovered in our research was that in reality, the phenomena could actually come down to which particular information theory you as the observer chose to use to describe the events. 
So it may not be an inherent property of the events themselves, depending on how they were generated, but maybe a bias which you impute onto the data. And I'm actually going to put a slide up of my collaborators, because some of them are here, actually, and they're all good to talk to. Thank you.